Thank you all for this really amazing honor. Um, and truly, I'm very humbled to be the speaker for the 41st Lester Breslau Lecture. I wanted to put this one up because we hear about Lester frequently, and for all the right reasons. I can picture him just recently, just even a few years ago, walking down the hall. He had always had this smile, this sense of joy about him with his hat, his tam shanter on, and just always had a good word to, for everyone. Um, but his colleague, Deborah, has had her own professional endeavors that I think often don't get recognized by all of us in the School of Public Health often enough. And I was intrigued because cancer is an area that you've been interested in, but also the heart and mind and the integration of that for health, which has been a passion of mine for all these years. And I actually um, spent some time with Norman Cousins at the center, which you were probably part of starting all of that. <coughs> so it was very exciting uh, to be presenting this lecture on behalf of both of you. So thank you, Deborah, for your contribution. <laughs> what I'll be presenting on is the making do or making anew. This emanates from my life experiences and a statement that a nurse preceptor told me when I was in nursing school. I grew up in Berkeley, in a, uh, which my parents told me many years later was segregated at the time they bought a house. And so I lived in the black section of Berkeley. All the, all the, of those of us of color lived in one section. I thought that was normal. And at San Francisco General, one of the nurses, I had been rotating, in the way we did it in San Francisco was we rotated through every hospital in San Francisco for the different um, specialties. And then I was at San Francisco General. And I went up and I was constantly asking the, the preceptor nurse, where is this, where is that, where do I find this, you know, when should I do this or that? And, <laughs> and that's my granddaughter. <laughs> She's a future public health professional. <laughs> and I, I went up to her and I said, where can I find the, the washcloths? And she was just so exasperated by that point, but kindly just put her arm around me. And she said, Margie, this is a county hospital, not a private hospital. Here we make do. And I realized that that was my whole life, but I thought that was normal. You always do what you can with less or not enough. The other is that that's my brother and me. This is also my brother, my two cousins. So living in multiple worlds is also a reality for those of us in communities of color. This is a birthday party. I, I, unfortunately, my dad has Alzheimer's and can't tell me. But this is a birthday party. Look at everybody's expression. You know, I, <laughs> um, I thought birthday parties were supposed to be fun, but apparently not back in the day. <laughs> when I started reading the literature in my training, what I was struck by was how um, communities of color were portrayed in the literature as lazy, as fatalistic, as not intelligent, as unable to make decisions, and importantly, Cliff, you know, the number one thing you said we needed to do was think. I thought, oh, what a novel idea, <laughs> you know, how refreshing. Um, so this cartoon uh, sort of, uh, Sidney Harris must be an anthropologist because I love his cartoons, but this is how the dinosaur lived in real life, goes extinct, gets excavated by scientists, and reconstructed in the way that they thought he looked like. <laughs> and when I would read the literature, that's how I saw communities of color represented. I've had several doctoral students who have been told, who are going into their particular area of focus for their research because they say, I never hear the Latina voice in the, in the studies about Latinas. 
I never hear the black voice in studies about African Americans. So why is that? The demographics of our country are changing astronomically and at a supersonic pace. Uh, David Williams was just here the last few days, and he said that now, this year, the majority of babies born in the United States are non-white. By 2020, 18 years and younger will be non-white. By 2042, everyone, the entire population, will have a majority non-white. He said, okay, that's interesting. We sort of all know that. The other part, he said, let's jump to 2060. For every person who's receiving Social Security, the majority are white. There will be only two people paying into the Social Security program to support your pension. So I'm looking to the younger folks here. <laughs> this is you. One of those will be black or Hispanic. If we don't address the issues of health, education, and good jobs for those population groups in the United States, we are sunk and you will have no pension. We will not be competitive in this world. The public health of this country is doomed. So, the field of health disparities takes on a different salience. So, what did we do, me uh, and a group of, of colleagues, to address this problem? We wrote a grant. That's what scientists do. <laughs> and luckily, we got funded. And as Dr. Dean Hyman indicated, this is the first. It was um, issued last week. It's on the OBSSR website. It's the Cultural Framework for, for Health. There is a, a committee of 30 people who worked on this. I had a colleague who looked at the list. If you, each of you look at that, I'm sure you'll see names of people. You've either read their articles or you know them. And he said, you constituted a dream team. I said, yes, I did. And what was phenomenal about this is that I issued the invitation letters on the same day. And within two hours, I had 12 people write back to me and said, count me in. And by a week and a half, everyone had said yes. Not a single person declined. Only one person declined, but she was taking on the chair of a department that was having a lot of problems. So <laughs> she didn't think she could devote the 18 months to this project. The other is that every phase of the project, every single person stayed on it. With the editing, with the web calls, everything. That's how committed this group is to this issue. Culture is usually, um, I should follow this. Culture is fundamental to human existence. Uh, Clifford Geert said, there is no such thing as human nature independent from culture. It's a way of life through which we construct, negotiate, institutionalize, and finally end up calling reality. Despite its central role, though, no other variable used in health research is so poorly defined and untested as culture. In fact, it's usually used, defined by what's unknown. And you do the statistical analyses, it doesn't come up all that strong. You say, well, it must be culture. But culture was never measured to begin with. So how can you, know, you have any idea of what the contribution would be? And if it were operationalized and measured correctly, maybe you would find an effect. Those of us who believe there is um, are on that committee. <laughs> And for many of you sitting here today, too. So we all learn uh, the wheel of research from theory, doing the studies, disseminating it, implementing it in practice, and then the wheel continues. And hopefully our knowledge grows. But what hasn't been recognized it, is that it occurs within a cultural context. And this has been ignored. We're usually studying the other and not reflecting on who is actually doing the study and how the theories were developed in the first place. Uh, a paper by Henrik Heine and Norazayan called We Are Not All Weird People. Now this was published in Nature. 
So the science behind it is quite extensive and quite strong. And they argue that most of the people doing the research are weird, and 98% of the subjects that participate are weird, which stands for white, industrial, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. <laughs> <laughs> which makes up only 12% of the world's population. And yet these theories are assumed to be universal. And yet they've not been tested. The NIMH uh, funded five ethnic study centers in mental health about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and asked them to look at the standardized scales and test them cross-culturally. Not surprisingly, all those that were tested were not cult cross-culturally equivalent. And yet we continue using them as though they are, and then wonder why we can't find um, the key. So again, Sidney Harris said that in most research, we're trained to answer the unanswered questions. But we haven't looked at the unquestioned answers. And this is the kind of work that I'm involved in, um, which I've found to be much more <laughs> difficult. <laughs> if I want the, the more... Um, paved path, I think it would have gone more quickly. But we lack a grounded concept of culture. The me and measures that accurately operationalize the aspects of culture that most affect the health issues of focus. Studies that test the hypotheses of culture's impact on health outcomes is really lacking. So if I were to ask each of you to write down quickly what is culture, I'll probably get a different definition from each of you. That's also in the professional literature, which is why this project was so amazing as the PI on it, is that everyone was willing to give a little and come up with a consensus definition. And we have to do that. If, how many of you have heard of five a day? It better be 100% here. <laughs> <laughs> Only one, okay. Eating five uh, fruits and vegetables a day. Bill, you're going to have to get out there. If nobody else has raised their hand, only one person Actually, raised their hand. Days. Pardon? Actually, it's nine a day. Nine a day. Well, that's true. That's true. It was five. Um, but that didn't help either because that was in 1994 to 2003. All the millions of dollars spent, how much of an effect has it had? You know, 2006 is on there as well in the data, and it's not, it's not moved. It's still the same. So we keep doing the same thing and keep getting the same results, thinking that if we just yell louder, you know, maybe it'll make a difference. So the three goals for this report is what I'm going to go over with you um, now, is first to define culture for health research, to provide a roadmap to guide researchers, reviewers, and funders in the measurement and application of a more scientifically valid concept of culture, and then to illuminate the monocultural, Eurocentric basis of health behavior science. Um, Heine and, and or Henrik and colleagues in their paper about weird people said that the only way they could have gotten it published is they were three white men. <laughs> uh, I thought it was, it was humorous, but also I think very telling. So that what I'm going to go through are um, the 10 challenges uh, one through six are the conceptualizations of culture and then the operationalization and application then to health disparities research. First, it's inadequately theorized and inconsistently applied. The lack of clear definitions, measurable constructs, conceptual, and conceptual models of how cultural processes interact are also lacking. And the cultural groups are defined devoid of, and this is critical, their historical, geographic, social, and political contexts and the influence, influence of these contextual factors on their access to resources and social positions in societal power hierarchy. I put this up because of the OMB categories and the diversity that's within the white population. Mm -hmm. Middle Easterners are there much to their dismay because <laughs> they can't tease out the data to do any 
studies on their populations because they can't find them. They're not listed in that way. Um, I keep Yugoslavia up there to show that even though they may have looked alike, the ethnic differences were so strong, people were willing to die for their ethnic identity. And that's how strongly people hold to them. It's not something that just happens to be what you cross off on a piece of paper. The conceptualizations um, require that culture be conceived of as extremely dynamic and not a static box you can check off. Recognition of the role of culture in shaping the nature and conduct of the scientific process has not been uh, evaluated. And the, the issue that everyone has culture, our, our project officer said, start from the premise that um, every, um, all God's children have culture. So what are your lenses that you use to see the world and to formulate your research questions? But the assumed universality of the dominant culture's constructions, such as selfhood, family, fairness, it's not the fatalism, you know, what you usually see in studies, at least in cancer, about different ethnic groups, is currently unproven that these are universals and therefore should not be assumed. The monocultural view impacts unreflective use of theories developed and validated in European Americans and usually educated populations. For psychology, it's done in Psych 100 classes with undergraduates, which the authors say is even more weird. <laughs> um, and if you look at child development projects, um, theories, it's done on people who have the ability to come into universities and have their children observed. So these are <coughs> usually white middle class families who have that ability. Designs of studies based on these multicultural norms end up with the idea that we can tailor, we can take these theories and all we have to do is tweak it for a different cultural group, put it in language, put a little flair on it, um, play a mariachi band if you're out reaching to Latinos, <coughs> and that's going to get the message across without even thinking that the whole concept of health is different. And then how do we then create a project that is actually more relevant, applicable, and usable to the populations we're working with? And the tools then have not been tested for cross-cultural equivalence, and as I indicated, those that have are not. So it should put into doubt many of the, all the others. And it raises ethical questions regarding the imposition of one particular viewpoint on everyone else and as assuming then that that's how we're going to get you healthy. If their concept is totally different, their priorities are elsewhere. But the United States is extremely diverse and there's a lot of blending that goes on. I have another slide my husband took downtown, but the police department is on it now, but it was the stand, if any of you are longtime Angelinos, you remember the kosher burrito stand that was right there. So, Assuming that they, you can delineate them by checking off various boxes is also um, a difficult concept to, to see as scientific. The use of nominal dichotomous variables and or ethnicity or ancestry to represent culture is simplistic and it totally inadequate. The within group heterogeneity should be made explicit in studies and demonstrated in the description of the study sample. And the acontextual focus on the individual without historical, political, and social environmental circumstances of the individual and group is inadequate. So the OMB directive categories uh, serve one purpose. I ask my students, what does OMB stand for? Folks, I'm asking. What does that have to do with health? <laughs> So understand why it was developed. It was, it was written in 1972 following the Civil Rights Act in order to monitor business practices by ethnic groups to see if we're making any progress. It had nothing to do with health status. But we use race as a biologic term, even though we say scientifically there's no race, racial differences by biology, it is socially. And how then are we uh, differentiating between the two? 
So the tenth challenge on health disparities is one through nine, is, and contributes to the in, inability to effectively eliminate health disparities. Okay, what that has to do with um, mortality trends is that, yes, in cancer, most groups are dropping in cancer rates. That's great. However, the gap that has existed for the last 50 years has remained the same. So the gap in some places is the same in most, and in others it's actually widened. So if we don't start doing something differently quickly, uh, that's the majority of Americans, and the cancer rates for the entire country are going to start going up again. So we have to define what culture is and what it does. Uh, I'll just skip that one. It is a shared framework or lens that its members learn to use to see the world and informs consciously and, importantly, unconsciously how to live life, why they live life, and how to resolve the problems in doing so. Because it's unconscious, it's next to impossible to get at them via a questionnaire. Because people don't know how it influences their thinking. It just is their reality. It's created and modified within a multidimensional, multi-level, and dynamic adapting ecologic system of internal and external resources and restraints. I administered a survey knowing, uh, a questionnaire, knowing that it was going to be, or hoping, it was going to be different between Japanese Americans and Anglo Americans on self-esteem. What really surprised me was that they both scored the same. Now, being, this was in older Japanese Americans, and this is from my grandmother to my mother, um, and making do, it's all handmade. Uh, that what the difference was, was in defining self-esteem. Most of us have been trained in psychology in the United States that self-esteem is identity, um, individuality, identity, feeling good about yourself. When I asked the Japanese Americans, how do you define um, self-esteem, they said humble, and no ego. <laughs> so the words were the same. The meanings were totally different. So we have to be much more careful and discerning in making sure that the words are equivalent. Culture provides the social structure that defines and coordinates the numerous roles of each of its members and importantly, the rules of social interaction according to distribution of power. And that will differ between each cultural group, how that is done, and what is respected and what is not. Expre and it, it, it is ex culture expresses and sustains the reality of its members through the built environment, including our institutions. So our schools and the healthcare system is designed with the basic values of the majority population. In the United States, healthcare primary is patient autonomy, right? The right to individual decision making. That doesn't translate cross-culturally. That's not how decisions are made. And that's when passive, um, non-compliant, a lot of those kinds of adjectives get placed upon the various communities of color when the rules of communication aren't understood that they're different, that the value system that underlies it differ considerably. We can measure the, these multiple layers. We do it in many surveys, but we don't put them together in a dynamic system approach to how we look at culture. It begins with the environment. This is a, a McElroy, not McElroy from public, uh, from public Health, but McElroy from Anthropology and Townsend. And then I added the epigenetics because we know that that's a huge force and a really growing, exciting field to understand how, um, in the words of, of Bill Dressler, who's one of the authors on this, say how culture gets under the skin. It literally does through your neurons. 
and it does impact the, the hardwiring of your brain and your emotional response systems. All of those are culturally informed. And so to assume that we're all humans and we all react the same way is one of those universals that has not been demonstrated. And for those of us who work in, in diverse communities, we know that that's not true, and our efforts then are to how to differentiate them. The one study that's been done on um, testing these is by a colleague of mine, Rena Pasek at UC San Francisco. And she used a mixed method study to look at the five most common concepts used in public health theories for mammography for Filipinas and Latinas. Perceived benefit, perceived susceptibility, self-efficacy, intention, and subjective norms. And then what they found was on the deductive survey, all of those held. A little bit more, a little bit less, but not significantly. But in their inductive qualitative interviews, all of five differed, and most importantly, intention for behavior. And what she found instead were three social context themes. Relational culture, how people interact, what are the obligations, responsibilities to each other, how the, and all of these impact then decision making. Social capital, and the transculturation, transmigration forces on these two communities. So the cultural context influenced behavior directly, circumventing or attenuating the influence of individual beliefs operating at an unconscious level. Okay, that is key. And influenced by factors not consistent with an exclusive focus on the individual as behavioral theories postulate. So we always have to take in, or we take in the context of the individual, their community, and their social status in this country. And their conclusion was the applicability of such theories are questionable in diverse cultural groups. I tend not to be quite so patient and, and um, respectful. Uh, so, just to measure cultural equivalence, if any of you are interested in doing that tomorrow in your next uh, study, is these six, at minimum, there are about 52 uh, cultural equivalent uh, categories, but, or criterion, but each of them, at least these six, should be demonstrated in your studies before you begin asking anybody anything. So the cultural framework for health uh, has been defined by more than what is known, as I said, than uh, what is known about populations. So we created this consensus definition for health research to, and provided a roadmap for researchers to use to inform both the role of the assessment of their own culture as well as the culture of the group of focus. And we highlight that using a scientifically based concept of culture constitutes a new and necessary and overlooked approach to the study of human behavior. Now, is this just the nice thing to do? Uh, Tom Leviste and his colleagues at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Res uh, Studies in 2009, so I keep these figures because they've gone up since then, but this was their study, spends $2 trillion or 16% of the GMP on health care. I think David Williams said 5% of the, U uh, the U.S. makes up 5% of the world's population and spends 50% of all health care uh, expenditures. But between 2000 and 2006, they found that eliminating health disparities would have reduced direct medical care by $229.4 billion, or 30% of that expenditure. So that difference is 56% with direct costs and indirect medical costs for health disparities, and that if we eliminated them, we'd save $1.24 trillion. So it makes economic sense as well. John Barry is a social psychologist in, in um, Canada, and he said this is the desired multicultural model. This is what we think we have, or at least what we aspire to. But 
just on this campus, um, what was it, last month? This young woman was voted off the student council because she's Jewish and they felt she would not be impartial in her decision making. It was overturned, but the fact is that she was voted off. Barry's model of multiculturalism is the reality. And this is my high school class, or at least the group within my high school that I spent the most time with. This is the group that I also grew up with. And so my views of reality and the research world are very different. And I'm hoping that what I can see you know, will be garnered by others. This is in um, Columbus, Ohio. A friend of mine, uh, this was her car. She was very upset because she's Chinese. <laughs> what we have in the School of Public Health is an amazing, as you've seen examples of, uh, phenomenal students. Uh, you are our future in public health and just go for it. We'll do all we can to support you. These are the subgroups within the overall Public Health Students Association. This is really exciting. They're you know, really passionate about their area of, of interest. We also have these two groups. And this means we are making do. They're trying to survive within the reality of the social structure of the United States. Why do we still need these groups and public health students associations? This was my husband's question to me. This is 2015. Why do you still need it? And I realized, having grown up in the way I have, it was my reality. And we've always just made do. So I'm hoping then, uh, Thomas Jefferson said, there is nothing so unfair to give than to give equal treatment to unequal people. Another way was Melvin Connor. In order to treat each other equally, you must treat each person uniquely. We have to get beyond categories and the snap judgments we make about people by the way they look. Imagine a fielding school of public health in which students do not feel the need for a separate group in order to feel supported, accepted, and safe. These are comments I've heard over the last 15 years since the Students of Color and Public Health were formed. These were the reasons they said they needed this group. It still exists in 2015. As a single drop of water spreads its impact, let us begin here in our school to make a new a place where we manifest equality and inclusion among our students, faculty, and staff, first with each other, and then in our practice and research. We will then be able to really appreciate and enjoy the diversity that our school represents and holds within its walls. The new culture is fundamental basis for health. We can have a drop. We can have a tidal wave. <coughs> So it's all up to us. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. I've asked Margie to stay up for questions. We just have time for a couple questions, but I just want to add my both words of personal thanks for all Margie's doing nationally and here at the school and the fact that this really is so central to everything we do not only central because of how America is changing but central to excellence some of the other statistics that I know Margie knows well but that she didn't mention when you look at the most effective organizations you look at the most successful organizations in the private sector, you look at the most profitable, they are the ones that are diverse, that have richly wide ranges of views and experiences and bring them all together. So this is something that matters to the health of everyone and to the success of everything we do. Thanks so much. We actually have a, a question. Uh, 
from a, a science and statistics perspective, we want to be precise and make sure things have protocols. From a human perspective, we want to be inclusive, not, not emphasize boundaries and so forth. And I'm just curious how you uh, manage that dynamic in your professional work. I mean, we have to come up with research protocols. I mean, how, how do you define certain categories when you want to do between group comparisons that have to do with ethnic groups or cultural groups? Trying to make explicit as possible the subgroups within each of the larger groups that we're comparing and try to assure that those are comparable in some areas and then we're looking for the differences, if there are. So it makes it much more um, challenging to get sample size, but I think when we do and we're able to and work in partnership with communities because they become, we usually start there and help them uh, help us to be able to ask better questions. Uh, just one simple one, uh, uh, in one of the projects, we were working with nine different ethnic groups, nine different languages, and we were talking about the success of the project. And I said, but I know what I think the success of the project is, but I don't know what each of you think success will be in your community. And one of them, the Samoan Nurses Association, uh, no, this was Guam Communication, said, when our phone rings at least 20 times a day with people turning to us to ask for help, because then we'll be recognized as a source of help in our community. Now, that's measurable. That's easy. And it had nothing to do with any of the list of things that I had. You know, so those are the kinds of things to make sure that what they're doing is going to impact their communities now. You know, I'm asking questions for later on, but they want it now. And when we can partner like that, I think it strengthens our research and it strengthens their ability to serve their communities. So that the kinds of questions that they then bring to us next time you know, help us to formulate questions and identify groups even within their population, subgroups within, say, the Chamorro community here in the Los Angeles area, to be able to more scientifically control for the kinds of variances that, will, that would otherwise confound our findings. So it's, it's not impossible. It is more difficult. It is more time consuming. But I think we get better answers. And if it makes a difference in the behavior in the community, then, you know, it's a win. Uh, and my name is Ivy. I'm a second year DR teaching at Queen's Health. Uh, my question for you is um, about the importance of qualitative methods in inductive research. I'm just curious if you've had any. Um, so in my experience at the Feeling School of Public Health, there's much of, a, of an emphasis on the, quality, uh, on the quantitative methods and the deductive methods. Um, with you retiring, one of our prized um, classes, the qualitative methods class, um, we're worried about that being lost, and that's the only class being offered in the School of Public Health, um, and one of the only ones on, on this campus. I'm curious if this is so important in addressing health disparities in communities of color. What are your suggestions on boosting um, the, the knowledge and the skills in our public health professionals to do this kind of research? That's well, Heidi, you know that personally, that's a passion of mine, so I would not let that go. But Steve has assured me that that's something that he wants to continue having taught. You have the dean here who has heard uh, your message. And, <laughs> and the power of this. <laughs> oh, Heidi. Yeah. And, and the interest by scientists in doing mixed methods. You know, so we're getting pressure from researchers. We're getting, obviously, the students should speak up and put the pressure on because you're the new world. You know, and it's the science that you'll be doing, and we need to prepare you and give you the skills to build on to be able to answer the kinds of questions that you're going to be asking. So, yes, that's my, <laughs> uh, my <laughs> answer to that. So I've heard this idea of cultural humility as opposed to cultural competency. Cultural competency being that I'm going to learn about your culture, therefore I'll know about it as your doctor, and I'll do the right thing cultural humility being, I don't know about your culture, but I want to talk to you and learn about it from you so I can do the right thing. 
And I wanted to know, as a student, how can I develop that type of approach to research, or how do you envision the training of future public health professionals to instill that kind of skill and understanding in the next wave? I think we build on why you came into public health, because you wanted to know answers. It's being inquisitive and knowing what you don't know. And most of us don't know about other cultures in the depth that we would need to in order to develop questions that will help them. Because they should, we should be helping them help themselves and giving them the skills. But if we don't know what they are, we can't do it. If we think our toolkit is going to fix their problems, that's a no-go. So we want to know what the community needs and what skills we have that may contribute to the solutions and the ability for them to solve the problems. Uh, Gil Friedel, who is a, an oncologist and head of the Kentucky Cancer Center, said that if the problems are in the community, the solutions are in the community. So it behooves us to ask and to listen and to learn before we are so bold as to say, we have answers to your problems. You know, I think that's the arrogance aspect versus the humility. Um, Melanie Turvalon, I think, at UCSF coined that term. Uh, having done cultural competency work for the last 30 years, that's been my frustration, is the idea that all we need is what I call the drug card approach. This is what Latinos do, this is what Asians do, and then you're competent. And that's not the point of this, is really to learn who is sitting before you and what motivates them to come to see you and what they think is going to be a benefit. And then you negotiate. Unfortunately, the structure of the healthcare system with the shorter encounter times really mitigates the ability of clinicians to do that. They didn't go into medicine just to check off boxes, um, which is what they're forced to do now. And so how do we get back the humanity in the interaction? You know, and that's in everything that we do, whether it's our research, it's our community outreach and education, is asking them what they need first. They already know. And it just behooves us to find out that and work on those things first. People ask me, well, you know, how do you do CBPR? And I, I tell them, I do that. You spend 18 months to two years with them showing that you're trustworthy. You just don't tell them you can trust me. You have to prove it. You know, these are very savvy communities, and they know, and they've developed good gatekeepers, and whether they're going to be with you or not depends on how trustworthy you are, and that takes, um, requires you to listen you know, with your heart and your mind. Uh, there's a Chinese character, anyone here that writes Chinese can, could write the character for listen. This is a century-old character. But it's what we is new, uh, new, I mean, this was 40 years ago when I was in training. But it's with your heart, your mind, your eyes, and your soul. And that's captured in the character, Chinese character, listen. And that, I think, would be a good start. <laughs>